Why are landscape photographers, in my opinion, the first most important art photographers? Because they were making photographs to sell to artists. As soon as photography was invented, people figured out ways to use it. And painters were first on the list because they now could have study guides. They don't need to have a figure in their studio all the time. They could have a photograph of that pose and they could work from photographs. They were called etude de nature. My friend, the photographer and collector Don Camera, has another exhibit at the University of the Arts. We get to see a set of 19th century photographs. The makers were businessmen hustling to make a living. They documented scenes for clients, some of whom were painters who desired reference material. It was a business that photographers jumped into quickly because they had a viable clientele. And in my opinion, that put them at the highest level of picture makers because their customers were the most demanding of customers. They wanted it to be a piece of art in and of itself. The object was not considered a piece of art. The object was considered a study guide. That's all it was. But in hindsight, it was a beautiful thing in and of itself. So for me, this is really the first generation of serious art photographers. All these are what are called albumen prints, which was the main kind of photograph made between the 1860s and the early 1890s when silver and platinum and other metals kicked in. They were made with glass negatives. It's referred to as the wet plate process. The photographer's assistant was with his dark room box. They had to make the negative right there on the spot. They started with a clean piece of glass, and over the course of 15 minutes, in a little dark space with just their hands, they coated it with all kinds of chemicals, they had to feel it for evaporation and just the right degree of stickiness, and boom, they put it in the camera, make the picture, go back to the dark room and develop it. And all this gets done within 15 to 20 minutes. Otherwise, you lose brilliancy and the quality suffers. Don told me that because of how difficult the process was, most artists used trusted professionals. Painters embracing photographs immediately. Delacroix was known for using photographs and had his own photographer that he used all the time. The photographers that had to supply those pictures had to have a similarly sophisticated vision. But eventually, some artists mastered the techniques and made their own photographs. Don showed me some examples. This picture was done by a guy named LaBelle, Edmund LaBelle. He was the director of the Academy at Rome, a painter of ceremonial paintings, and this was really a study guide of a really fancy donkey saddle, encrusted with all kinds of gold and bronze and fanciness. Put it on that sawhorse, he stuck it in his courtyard, and he made that picture, which in my opinion has an incredibly mysterious and wonderful quality. All the pictures you've seen now are individual pictures that I bought over the years and they've been taken out of the albums decades ago. But this is an album that was owned by an artist. He lived in Delaware in the late 1800s and this, these were pictures he took. This was after the invention of the Kodak camera. So these were taken in the early 1900s. And these are pictures that he would use to paint from. So if he was gonna paint a haystack and somebody working at it, he would definitely go to this photograph and use that element a high key, dark and light environment for silhouette, he'd have that. Nice one. You know, the girls in the white dresses coming out of the dark background. Mm. All around his property. Obviously he was a wealthy guy. Either he owned this boat or was a friend of his, I'm sure. There you go. The juxtaposition between the woman in the dark dress and the dark trunk is very deliberate. She's centered in between those two trees. That's a very deliberate composition by someone who's making a picture that's more than just a casual snapshot, but a more thought about type image. Back at the University of the Arts, Don talked about each photo in the exhibition. Henry Clay Cochran did this image in Jamaica. He was a military guy stationed all over the world in the mid-19th century. And he was in Jamaica in the 1870s. And everywhere he went, he made these beautiful 8x10 glass negatives. 
We have Isaiah Tabor photographing out west with the great redwoods. And I love this picture because of the, what I call the Domestic Bliss series. I've been collecting a small collection of people with their houses. I love my house and everything about it. My whole life is surrounded around my domestic life. So people in their houses, that little couple, you can see they're very happy to be among the redwoods. August Koch. He was the German Ache. Ache was a very famous photographer in Paris in the early 1900s that many believe was truly the first modern photographer in that he really didn't make art. He made almost like cell phone pictures that a citizen photographer would make nowadays. There was no pretension. There was no artistic influence or content. It was just a great poet seeing everyday life. In the 1870s, 20 years before Ache began, August Koch did it in Germany. James Valentine was the greatest photographer in Scotland in these 1860s to 1870 years. Not only a great vision, but a great technician, a great craftsman. What constitutes great quality in a photograph is the minute variations in tone. Thousands of tones are possible to be captured in those layers of silver, and really good craftsmen could max that out, like this picture of what I think is a smokehouse and the very fantasy little road that proceeds. We have a picture of a baby goat that is very unique because of its naturalism. This guy had an artist's eye. He was actually a count, so he was a real aristocrat. These exposures oftentimes took a quarter of a second or a half a second. Stop-action photography will not be invented for another 30 years. So it was always a slowish exposure. But yet that baby goat is caught in such a naturalistic pose. It's so content. And the texture of the fur of the goat, the hay and the stone in the background, Constant Femine, one of my stable of artists. I guess I have about eight or nine of his pictures right now. I think Corot may have been his father-in-law. A brief interjection. Corot preceded the Impressionists and is without a doubt one of the greatest landscape painters who ever lived. I found out that he had a clear interest in the new technology behind photography. Now back to you, Don. Tell us some more about Famine. These were two separate pictures, but I was sure that he was seeing them as a diptych. So I took the liberty, as most curators would not, and I combined them myself. I'm sure the way the horizon lines were lining up that he saw this as a diptych. That tree is anchor in that upper right-hand corner for a reason. It's all about value and tone and balance. More for me up here, an absolute study guide for artists to have the exactitude of a hazelnut branch, and when that is in their pictures, they know they're getting it right. We're moving toward modernism here. The background's been eliminated. It's just flat laid on a piece of dark cloth as if it was a modernistic, seamless background. Down here we have a wonderful peasant study of a young girl, very sexy pose, swirling branches in the background. These were done by a publisher. He went by the name of Auguste Gridon. He didn't make the pictures himself, he claimed. Yes, a lot of the series are referred to as Gridon's artist. So who is that? Oh, it's a famous artist. I can't tell you who it is. So it was just a publicity thing, but his pictures that he sold had their own special quality because maybe he did have some guys that were willing to work for him and keep their name off the picture. Peasant study to just give you a sense of what the plows looked like and how the man in his work clothes looked. And it's really just a document. It's a document. American guy, C.R. Savage, he was Irish, he came here. Classic businessman, he did portraits, he did everything. He had a trademark of finding these little moments where a solitary tree sat on the top of a hill. So that was happening over and over again in his pictures. There are not a lot of them because he wasn't very famous and he wasn't very prolific and I've only had an opportunity to get this one and I've never really seen them even available. Edmund LaBelle, he composed it, he set it up. Whether or not he 
crafted it with his own hands or he hired somebody who knew the medium to be his assistant, but he was the one that created the composition. You look at these pictures close, they're just so perfect. You know, the way the steps kind of curl at the end of the donkey and the way things go out of focus up there in the pots, everything is in the perfect place. I often tell my students, when there's nothing there that doesn't belong there, you got a good photograph. Alphonse Jean Reynaud was part of that earlier crowd. He was from Gustave Le Gray's crowd, 1860. So he's one of the few photographers I have from way back. To me, they are just perfect representations of nature. I mean, what is nature? It's everything, right? It's calm, it's wild, it's predictable, it's unpredictable. When you look at landscape pictures and paintings, you can find an answer out there. As far as I'm concerned, everything true about life can be found in the landscape.